Welcome to Regeneration Service. I'm going to open this up with pastoral prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me now to pray. God, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. God, that even through this pandemic, you are still doing your work within our churches, within our ministries. And God, we want to pray for those who are struggling and wrestling with the coronavirus, Lord, that you would give them strength and healing, that you would be with their family. And we thank you for all of those medical workers who are still out in the field fighting against this pandemic. And Lord, I pray that we as Christians would be bold and step forward during this time to love the world. And God, I pray also for our church that we would learn how to, to unify. You would pray for each congregation member that, Lord, you would uh, teach them how to not just <clears throat> let this time at home be burnt away, but, Lord, to really develop and focus on the relationships that they have that you've given them. And, Lord, to focus on you. God, we're just so thankful for all that you're doing. And may you continue to bless our church and the ministries that are happening. Lord, may you bless the children's ministry and the youth ministry that as they have their meetings. And God, we just know that you're going to do your work. So we lift all this up into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, we are going to be reading from Genesis chapter 27, uh, 17, verse 1 to 27. So if you would read with me now, uh, you can either flip to it yourself or you can look on with me. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I'll give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, <clears throat> you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. 
and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. <clears throat> And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house are bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. That very day, as God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. This is the word of God. Before I begin my sermon today, I want to introduce us to a Japan, very popular Japanese anime. It is about this team of people who gather together to go on a journey throughout the world to search for some obscure treasure. Now, during this journey, they face many different difficulties and trials that causes them to put their friendships to the test, their relationship, their skills, and their teamwork to the test. And along the way, one of their team members, let's say her name is Rain, gets kidnapped and captured by the world government. And she is now condemned and sentenced to death for some crime that she had committed in the past before joining the team. And her teammates, hearing this upon finding out, rush to her aid. See, they want to save her. But when, and so after days and weeks of planning and fighting through the government armies, when they finally meet her face to face, instead of welcoming them, welcoming them with open arms, Rain instead pushes them away. She says, why are you even here? I never even cared about you guys to begin with. I was lying to you this whole time, just using you guys. Leave now. Just let, leave me behind. I don't care about you. And in trying to push them away at this moment, the leader of the team, let's call him Larry, asks one of his teammates to shoot down the government flag. See, he knows something deeper. And so he tells, them, tells his teammate to shoot down the flag that represents the government. In doing so, though, he basically would make his whole team enemies of the government. And yet his teammate willingly does so. And after he does so, Larry says to Rain, tell us and give us a sign that you want us to save you. Give us a sign that seals the deal between our relationship. Give us a sign that says you want to live. It is at that moment, filled with emotions, Rain shouts out at the top of her lungs that she wants to live that she wants to journey again with this team. And that sign was all that 
Larry and his teammates needed to seal the deal between their relationship with her, to remind them why they were here, to remind them why they were fighting. That sign that Rain gave clarified and foresaw the battles that were to come in order to save her. That's all that Larry and his teammates needed. The sign from Rain that she still wanted to live, that she wanted them to save her. Today, as we read, as we have read from Genesis chapters 17, verse 1 to 27, we can learn about a different sign of a covenant. And this one is between God and Abraham. And if you remember back in Genesis 12, 13, and 15, God has already made quite a few covenants with Abraham. And yet here, he's coming again to make a new one, a different one. And we know it's different because what God does here is he starts off by showing up and appearing to Abraham and then changing his name. His name was originally Abraham, which meant exalted or high father. But God wants him to change it to Abraham, which means the father of multitude. You see, the name that Abraham had been living with for 99 years is now going to be changed to something completely different. And for us, names are more so something we use to get someone's attention or to label someone. But back then, names had a much more powerful meaning. Names decided someone's character. It also showed the fate that they would have. And so God was trying to show here, Abraham, you are going to become the father of many nations. See, this was also a promise that God hadn't made before. In the past, God's promises with Abraham had always been, Abraham, you're going to have many descendants. You're going to have many children. Try to count the stars. Try to count the sand and the seas. That's how many descendants you're going to have. But at this moment, God made a promise that Abraham is going to be the father of many nations, of many kings. This is completely different. And God also adds one more stipulation, something that changes the playing field forever. And that is that God is going to establish this covenant with his descendants. This whole time from 12, 13, and 15, the promise of blessings has always only been between God and Abraham. But for the first time, God is saying that also your offspring will be part of this blessing. Your offspring, your descendants, every child that is to come from you and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth, will also be part of this covenant. This is a huge deal. This is like me asking you whether or not you want a million dollars today, or whether you want me to give you $100 every single day for the rest of your life and for the rest of your descendants' lives, $100 every single day. And if you can do the math, let's say the average lifespan of a man is like 70 years, oh, 70 years, and then th- multiply that by 365, multiply that by 100, and then multiply that by however many descendants you're going to have, which according to God is going to be a lot what's the better deal? God is making this kind of promise, this kind of covenant with Abraham and his descendants, not just to bless Abraham, but everybody coming after him. The blessing is going to be exponential. But God does more than just bless them. In verse 8, God says that he will be their God. See, that means something completely different right? It's the, if any of you plays any video games, it is the difference between being given a high-level weapon to fight versus having God as the NPC character who walks by your side, God who can basically defeat anything with one shot. The difference between having a high-level weapon where you still have to work really hard and an NPC, a non-player character who can defeat everything is a very, very big difference. And that's the kind of blessing that God is telling Abraham and his descendants. Not only will he give them descendants and nations and kings from their lineage, he will also be their God and be with them. This is what God is saying for the covenant. 
but also for the first time, God expects something from Abraham and his descendants. And that is this sign of the covenant, which we now know as circumcision of the flesh. See, God had used circumcision of the flesh as a sign that showed that Abraham and his descendants were now part of this covenant. Now, now, what do signs mean? I mean, throughout our lives, we see many different signs. The one I want to focus on here today is this question. How do you know? What is the sign to which a couple is married? Is it possibly when they're holding hands? Or maybe when they're walking with their children? Both of these are, are pretty good signs, but none of them are 100%. Instead, the universal identifier to whether someone is married or not is the ring on their left hand, on their ring finger. This ring is a sign that symbolizes that these two people have made promises and covenants with each other. This, uh, this ring is a sign that reminds other people that, hey, these two are taken, so back off. It is also a sign that reminds the wearers of the promise of the covenant that they have made with each other. This ring is also a seal to their promise to each other, the commitment that they've made to each other. That's how we identify whether or not someone is married this, through this sign. Now for God and Abraham and his descendants, Abraham's sign that he is part of God's plan. Abraham and his descendants signed that they are part of this covenant is through circumcision. When they are circumcised, it shows physically that they are not the same as other people around them. It's, that was their sign that sealed the deal between them and God. It's like a signature at the end of a contract. That circumcision, circumcision was that sign that sealed and showed their participation in this covenant with God. But it did more than just seal a sign. Because circumcision also acted as a sign of a reminder. A reminder to Abraham and his descendants that on one hand, they will be blessed. And on the other hand, that they are set apart by God. In other words, God will be with them. See, circumcision was that stamp of approval, was that signature that showed their participation. And every time they looked upon it, every time they, they remembered it, well, since it was part of their body, they would remember and be reminded that God will bless them and that God will be with them. These two are reminders of what circumcision is. And as I, and as I reflect upon this, there's still a question that comes to my mind. Why circumcision? Why another covenant? Abraham's had so many already. But as we just mentioned, I believe that God gave this, second co this other covenant is because he wanted to remind Abraham to keep him on his toes. Because we know, if you remember back in Genesis chapter 13, this, this guy kind of just gives away his wife. To Pharaoh when the push came to shove he just pushed her aside and then in Genesis 16 because he couldn't wait for God's promises anymore he decides to take on a second wife see Abraham he is the man of faith he's a good man and he he has done a lot and is very obedient but at the same time he makes mistakes at the same time he needs reminders and so I think God sent this covenant to remind him Remind him and keep him on his toes to remind him of the covenant between him and God. And we understand this too. We understand reminders. I mean, just open up your phone and look at your alarms for the morning when you wake up. If you're like me, you have a lot of different alarms, each at different intervals to make sure that you wake up on time. The first one is just, you know, to get your mind awake. And then the subsequent ones are to make sure that you really do wake up. See, we are used to reminders too. And so we can know that God made this covenant as a reminder. But there's more. If we read in verses 15 to 21, 
God introduces a new character into this. He asks Sarai to change her name because Sarai, now Sarah, is also going to be blessed. For the first time, Sarah is introduced as being part of this blessing, and she, it is through her that nations and kings of people will come. But if you guys remember how the story goes, Sarah doesn't have any children. That's why they had to go through Hagar. Sarah is barren. And Abraham thinks this is funny too, and he laughs, and he thinks to himself, logically speaking, this is impossible. Sarah is 90 years old. I'm 100 years old. How can we possibly have children? This makes no sense at all. And so he asked God, hey, you know, like logically speaking, how about Ishmael? He's alive and well. He just turned 13 too. He's perfect. Can he be the heir? But God replies very, very strictly here and says, no, it cannot be Ishmael. It has to be Isaac. And it's at this point where God clarifies for Abraham what is to happen in the future. See, this whole time, Abraham has been waiting and waiting for God's promise. And so when Ishmael finally came, he thought, this is it. This is the son from which who will be the heir to all my goods and everything I have. And yet God clarifies for him here, no, there's going to be Isaac. And he clarifies one more time. And for the first time, he says, gives him a time, give him a time step. It's going to happen next year. After all the years of waiting, God finally comes to Abraham and says, it is going to be exactly at this time next year that Sarah will have a son. See, God has this covenant to clarify for Abraham his intentions. And many times, that's what we wish for us, right? Many of us wishes that God would clarify for us what he wants us to do, where he wants us to go, right? Like what kind, of, uh, what kind of major should we study? Or what kind of job should we pursue? Or maybe when it comes to relationships, which one should I go for? Or it could be which church should I attend? Or maybe your option is, should I buy the new Animal Crossing New Horizons? See, when we're faced with all these different choices, when we're faced with all these different options, sometimes we freeze. We freeze up because we don't know what to do, right? What if, what if we make a decision now, but a better one comes down the line? Or what if we make a decision and we end up regretting the choice that we made? It didn't end up being as, as good as we thought it would. See, we struggle because most, many of us here struggle with the idea that we don't want to miss out on how good some of these options are. But we also don't want to regret our decision. And so what we end up doing is we sit on our butts until the last possible minute to make a decision. We sit around and wait and let other people try it out until finally we are ready to make that decision at the last minute when everything else is taken up. But you see, Abraham doesn't do that. Very different to how we act nowadays. Abraham immediately takes upon the option available to him. When Ishmael was born, you can imagine how happy and how joy, overjoyed he was. He loved Ishmael. He trained and taught him how to be his heir. Because that's the option that he was given. And yet he was still willing to listen to God. See, he was still willing to come before God at each time. He was saying, God, can it be Ishmael? Is this the way you want me to go? And what God does is God answers him. When Abraham asks for clarity, God gave him that clarity and told him, no, it's got to be through Isaac who's going to come next year. See, upon hearing this clarification from God, Abraham immediately obeys. Abraham immediately follows. And we see that he on that day makes that covenant with God. On that day, he takes everyone, all the males in his family, and he brings them and circumcises them. Abraham, man of faith, is also very obedient to God. But how about us? When we're faced with different and difficult choices, are we willing to be diligent with the places that God has given us, with the places God has placed us, whether it be school and academics or work 
or the relationships and families that he's placed us in? Or are we just more willing to sit on our butts, let time go by until the last possible moment that we need to decide on something, until the last possible moment that we need to do something? Or maybe some of us are pursuing things diligently. We're trying as hard as we can in our work, in our relationships, in school. And yet when God, and yet when we ask God for clarity and he tells us to change our direction, we ignore him. We continue just running down the way that, that we have already been going because it'd be too much work to switch. See, brothers and sisters, I want to challenge us here. God gave circumcision to Abraham and his descendants as a sign that sealed the covenant to remind them that they'll be blessed and that God will be with them. But he also uses circumcision, uses these signs to clarify his intentions. When God does that with us, are we willing to listen? Or are we too busy doing our own thing? Let this circumcision also be a reminder to us that if we come before God and ask for clarity, he will give it to us. But then we have to listen and be obedient. So, I have one more question that I need to answer for us. And that question is this. What does this covenant mean to us today? You see, circumcision and being Abraham's descendants, all of that is good and all, but I can barely remember my great-grandparents or my grandparents. How do I know who, if I'm part of Abraham's blessings or not? Because how do I know if I have Abraham's blood flowing through my veins? Who is considered Abraham's descendants? Surely none of us are because none of us are even Jewish. And yet it is Paul in the New Testament that answers this question for us and Moses in the Old Testament too. And so I'm going to give us a few passages that we're going to read through to answer this question for us. And so here they are. If you want to, if you want to look them up beforehand, by all means, but they're also going to be displayed on the screen. And so let me first start off with our first question. How do we know if we're going to be if we are descendants of Abraham or not. Because if we're not, this covenant, this promise, everything I just told you, told us means nothing. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, Paul says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all nations be blessed. So then... Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, what we see here is that Paul answers the question for us. It is not those who have the same bloodline of Abraham who are considered his descendants, but instead those who have the same faith that he has. See, and that faith is in believing in a God who has relationship with human beings. And believing in a God who is willing to bless and watch over and love human beings, but also in a God that created everything. A God that hates sin and sent a flood to destroy everything, but was willing to protect Noah. If we are willing to have that same belief, that same faith that Abraham had, we are considered sons of Abraham. We are considered his descendants. So we can be counted into these blessings. But now, what about circumcision? See, back then it was, acted, it was used as a sign, but nowadays it's less so a religious symbol as it is more of a medical choice or a choice by your parents. So what about circumcision then? Well, in Romans chapter 4, Paul also asks the same question. So read with me here. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. But is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? How was it then counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to him... Make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Romans 4, 7 to 12. 
see Paul, he starts off with saying that those who who are sin who are sinful but have their sins covered, they're blessed. See, those who are descendants of Abraham, they are blessed because they have that title of righteousness. Righteousness is that title that says your sins are forgiven, your sins are covered. But Abraham, but Paul then asks this very important question. Is it only for those who are circumcised? What about those who are uncircumcised? So he asks that very question that we're wondering ourselves because nowadays, like I said, circumcision is less so religious and some of us may or may not be. So what does it mean then for us? But he, and Paul answers himself with another question. When was Abraham officially counted as righteous? See, it did not happen in Genesis 17 as we would think, right? I, I challenge you, go and look through Genesis 17. See if you can find the word righteous. You probably won't be able to because it was not in Genesis 17 that Abraham was declared righteous. Instead, it was way back in Genesis 15, verse 6, where, and he believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. Abraham chose to believe the words that God said to him, took that verbal promise that he would have an heir, and Abraham believed. And God saw that faith, that belief that Abraham had, and counted to him as righteousness. You see, what determines someone as being righteous, what determines as someone having their sins covered, isn't some physical act of circumcision, but instead the faith that they have, the belief that God sent a son down to die for our sins, his blood washing it away and rising again to defeat death. It is in that belief and faith that we need a savior. That faith is what labels us as righteous. And he expands, and, and Paul expands on it in Romans chapter 2. And also Moses in Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. You see, what matters here isn't the physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart. And that sounds confusing, but what it means is that we are willing to cut off the pride and the stubbornness in our hearts and recognize that we can't save ourselves. Instead, we need a Savior. We need to believe in a God who loves us so much that he sent his son down onto the earth to live a life, to die on the cross for our sins, to glorify God. Moses, Abraham, and Paul all say here, what matters isn't the physical circumcision, but our hearts being circumcised so that we are willing to believe by faith. That's what matters. That's what matters today. Brothers and sisters, circumcision was that reminder from Genesis 17 to Abraham and his descendants. It was a sign that sealed the covenant between them and God and to all the descendants afterwards. So we're included in that. That reminder also tells them that they will be blessed and that God will be with them. And it clarified God's intentions for them. And yet, for us, it's a little different. Because no longer is circumcision of the body what we look to. Instead, God's intentions for Abraham, for all of mankind, was realized through Jesus. Jesus became that sign of the covenant, that, that seal between us and God, that solidified our relationship with God. And how we remember him is by the cross and the empty grave. See, the cross that he died upon, but the empty grave to prove and show that he is risen again, that he didn't just die forever. That cross and empty grave is what we look for, and it reminds us that on one hand, we are blessed with salvation. And on the other hand, God is with us. When we accept Jesus Christ into our life, when we are willing to recognize that we need a Savior and accept him into our lives, God lives within us and is present with us. See, for Abraham and his descendants, circumcision, that sign of the covenant, acted as a reminder and pointed towards the future blessings to come. 
But for us, we re that is realized through Jesus and his work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. We are offered salvation. We are offered for God to be with us. And all we need to do is believe by faith. Faith that isn't blind, faith that isn't just willy-nilly doing whatever it wants, but faith that is based off the facts from Scripture, from the Bible. Faith that is born through our experiences with Jesus, through the work that he has done in our lives. So brothers and sisters, today, as you listen and as we reflect on Genesis 17, let us remember circumcision as a sign of a covenant for Abraham and his descendants. But it travels down to us so that now we can see our sign as Jesus. And we can look upon the cross and the empty grave to know that we are offered salvation and that God is with us. And all we have to do is believe by faith. This is the word of God to you. This is God clarifying for us what we need to do to believe by faith. Are you willing to obey and believe? Let's pray. God, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you that you are constantly reminding us of the work that you're doing in our lives and showing us that you love us, that you want to bless us, but you also challenge us to follow you and be obedient. And it's not going to be easy. See, Abraham had such faith. And Lord, many times we wish we could have that faith too. So God, give us and teach us how to be faithful. Teach us how to follow you wholeheartedly. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, that is why I sing your praise. Will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. Making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, rid of all her shame, and known by her true name, that is why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised 
with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord that is why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips Right now, we're going to move into a time of announcements. And so there's a few that I want to give us. The first one is this, upcoming sermons. Next week on the 26th, we're going to have Pastor Jeff Wisman preach on hearts and minds on things above. And then on May 3rd, underneath, Pastor, I'm going to be preaching again on interceding for Sodom. We're going to be reading into Genesis 18. Next. Join us for prayer. Every Wednesday at 8 p.m., we will be praying together as an English congregation. Especially in times like this, I challenge you to join us for prayer. Also, feel free to join us for Sunday school at 10 a.m. every Sunday. If you want to find out more information about the prayer meeting or about this, please check our website, cccnj.org. And lastly, there is a parent meeting, a mandatory parent meeting for all the parents at 1.30 uh, p.m. tonight, or today. And if you want to know the link, it is down there, tinyurl.com slash cccnjygparents. Join us today, and we're going to be discussing how we as youth parents can be challenging and walking with our youths during this time of quarantine. That's all our announcements for today. from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Please rise with me as I give us the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. Please have a blessed Sunday and have a blessed week. Thank you.